And today we're going to start a new journey. We finished the book of Galatians last Sunday. And uh, today, today we began a new journey through the book of Ephesians. How many of you got your Ephesians journal? All right, look, I know he's happy. You didn't get a Galatians journal. We, so now you got an Ephesians journal. Um, yeah, so those are in. Um, I need to get myself one. And, uh, but um, use it. Fill it up. Write down what the Lord gives to you, and then 10 years from now, go back and look at it and see um, how he continues to bless you. One of the things I was sharing with the leaders this morning, and I'll share with you, we were in prayer and I was sharing with them, I said, guys, because a lot of them are teachers, and sometimes as teachers you tend to, you, you, can, you can almost get to a point where you know Scripture, and so you, it might feel a little difficult when you sit in the teaching. And I was like, guys, we need to always approach teaching not based upon what we know, but based upon where we are. So every time you open Scripture, it has the power to speak to you where you are in your life right now and what you're going through because the Scriptures are alive. Amen? And so that's why even as we begin this new journey, it has the, this, this book of Ephesians has the ability to reshape your life because the Bible says we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds anyway, right? And the scriptures are constantly trying to do that because the scriptures go contrary to what our natural man wants to do. And it reshapes our thinking and it washes out the filth that keeps creeping in and it mends the broken bones and it begins to set our heart right because remember the Bible is a discerner of the motives and intents of our heart like a two-edged sword, right? The writer of Hebrews describes it that way. And so when we open up the scriptures, not just on Sunday mornings, but as you do that uh, through your life every day, it has the power to do new and fresh works in you. And so we need to be in the Word of God. And it is the food that has been made for the Spirit. It's, it's, it's heavenly spiritual food. Amen? All right. Y'all seem real sluggish this morning. I don't know what's going on. It must be, second service comes in all lively. It must be coffee because y'all been dragging. So Ephesians chapter 1, hey, let's look at it and let's read a little bit and then we'll talk about it. Um, notice if you're there at verse 1, please say amen. amen. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us notice accepted in the beloved. So Father we do thank you this morning for the text that we have Lord. I pray Father as we even as now as we approach it as we've just heard it read out loud as we see it and hold it in our hands Lord, I pray that you would take it, Lord, and write it upon the tables of our heart. Wash and transform our minds with it, Lord God. Give us direction, Lord. Speak to us freshly of the things that concern you, uh, your heart to ours, Lord God. And I pray that you would remove the cares of this life from our hearts and minds, Lord, that we may hear. And the distractions from this room, Lord God, that we may focus in on what you have to say. And that you would do a fresh work in us and change us, sending us out of this place different than the way we came in. We trust that you alone can do that by your spirit. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we say together, saints. Amen. 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 So, um, fresh book, uh, Ephesians. And, you know, notice in verse 1 as it begins, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And I, I want to tell you right off the bat that I'm not going to spend time doing background on Paul or background on his apostleship. In fact, I would encourage you, there are no visitors this morning, right? There was no, nobody raised their hand. I would encourage, most of you were here as we went through the book of Galatians, and I would encourage you to go back on the website or the app to Galatians chapter 1 and li listen to uh, Galatians week 1, I should say, right about 10 minutes in. I had to go back and listen to it yesterday to make sure that what I'm telling you is so. So I went back and I listened to it, and I had to say, man, Lord, that's a good teaching. You did a good job, you know? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm watching it, actually. I was watching the video, and it was very evident to me that he was teaching. 
And I was like, man, I know that one in my notes. And I had to go back and pull them up. I'm like, man, where'd it come from? So I knew it was him. So I would say, go back and listen to week one of Galatians. And as I cover a lot about Paul's background, I cover um, a lot about his apostleship. You know, what is it? What is an apostle? What are the qualifications of an apostle? And are there any apostles today? So all of that I answered. Uh, uh, also his life, all of that was answered in that, that one, uh, that first week. And I will say this. Notice he says that it's by the will of God, and I always want to go back and touch on that just briefly, if you will, because you got to understand something. Paul never intended to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Y'all do know this part. He was trying to persecute the church and destroy it, and the Lord saved him. So he never had an uh, intention to do the very thing that he was doing. But it's something that God had called him to do. He wasn't doing it of his own will, his own planning or anything. He was simply in the perfect will of God, which is where we should individually seek to be in the perfect will of God. What has God called you to do? Where has God called you to be? Are you walking in that or are you wrestling with him? Because if you are wrestling with him, you will lose eventually. Just go ahead and lose now. Just tap out. Be done with it, you know. And let him have your life and let him have his own way with you because God chooses to direct your life and do it in a special way. But this is from Paul the Apostle. He is an apostle by the will of God. And this particular book of Ephesians, listen to me very carefully, is probably, according to some scholars, one of his best and most complete works. Some people say it's the book of Romans, you know, or maybe the book of Galatians. And those were amazing, weren't they? You know, but in, in those epistles, like most of them, Paul is dealing with issues like he was in the book of Galatians, right? There were some doctrinal issues that Paul was trying to set straight. The Judaizers were coming behind him and sowing uh, wrong teaching, and Paul was dealing with that. Paul was constantly dealing with issues that were popping up, and a lot of times his epistles were addressing those things. But this particular epistle is slightly different. It's really an epistle that is beautiful in that it's written in such a way that the church can take it and we can all individually take it and just apply it to our lives. It is literally a perfect picture of what the Christian life is, should be. And we're going to see that as we begin to go through this. Notice he says to the saints who are in Ephesus. And a lot of scholars, they point to the fact that in some of the older Alexandrian texts, in Ephesus is left out. So it kind of reads to the saints who are and faithful in Christ Jesus. So you, obviously something's missing. <laughs> but because of that, they point out the fact that, well, Paul never really intended to write it to the Ephesians. He doesn't address anybody personally at the end like he does other epistles. You know, we read through sometimes. And Paul will say, hey, make sure you tell this person hello for me, right? And, and greet this person for me, not if you know what I'm talking about. Because I'll stay here to second service. And <laughs> he doesn't do that in this epistle. And it has a general feel to it. And I get this sense, listen, I get this sense as Paul was writing this, Paul being in prison when he wrote it, his first imprisonment. So Paul, the, this guy who was wild and crazy and traveled and was just going after everything that God wanted him to do was now confined in Rome. And as he sat there in Rome and he thought about the church, he wrote from his heart those things that he needed for the church to know that he needs for us to know today. And in fact, he was so excited about it that when we get there, uh, if you look at it in the original manuscripts, verses 3, listen, verses 3, all the way down to verse 14 of this chapter is one continuous, uh, continuous sentence. It doesn't break anywhere. There's no breaks. He didn't even take a breath. He was so excited. Imagine that. He was so excited that he just got out the gate running and he didn't even slow down until he had laid out a whole lot of stuff of which we're going to look at today. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's divided in two basic parts, chapters 1 through 3. Paul really deals with the things that we have in the Lord, the riches that we have in Christ Jesus, if you will. Doctrinal things, doctrinal truths, stuff that we have to hold on to and know. And then what do we do with that in chapters 4 through 6? How do we walk that out as he begins to give us practical things that we must deal with in our everyday lives? How we live with one another. Loving one another, speaking to one another in, in psalms and spiritual songs and, and making melody in the heart with one another in fellowship, you know. And then how do we handle marriage and in employee relationships and unity within the body of Christ and spiritual warfare that's going to come up in all of our lives. These are the things that he gets into into the second half of the book. 
Okay, you with me so far? All right. I'm trying to wake you all up. I'm gonna come, I got to come up with a joke here in a minute. <coughs> and so we have this beautiful thing. Chapter 1, listen, chapter 1 divided up in three simple parts. We have the introduction here in verses 1 and 2, which I'm still in. And then we have the blessings we have obtained in Christ in verses 3 through 14. And it, it's kind of the Trinity's shared work of salvation, if you will, if you're taking notes. The Trinity's shared work of salvation because we're going to see the blessings of the Father in verse 3 through 6. Then we're going to see the redemptive work of the Son in verses 7 through 12. And then we're going to see the guarantee of the Holy Spirit in verse 13 through 14. And then outline point number 3 will be Paul's prayer for the spiritual wisdom of the church in verses 15 through 23. So we're going to spend about three or four weeks in chapter 1. Then we'll get off to a, a little faster pace. Okay, y'all with me? All right, we're going to finish this book in record time. And we're going to be blessed. <laughs> no, no. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and I just want to remind you, I hope you can say that by the will of God, you, you know, you by the will of God, if you can't, you might want to reevaluate your wife, your life. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> your life. <laughs> I don't have to reevaluate my wife. <laughs> Trust me. She's been praying for me all morning. You need to pray harder, though. <laughs> no, your life. Because your life, listen, I, I just want to keep encouraging. Your life need you need to be able to look at your life and see the will of God there. And so many people I talk to and, and pray with that come up with so many issues going on in their lives. And, you know, and, and, and they, they, they are focused on the, the thing in front of them and what they're going through. And it's just big mountain of a problem. And what they're missing is what is the will of God for my life in all of this? And so Paul, an apostle, of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints, and I love that, to the saints. It's a beautiful thing to think about because we don't always look at ourselves this way. In fact, the word saint is one of the most misunderstood words in, in, in modern religion, if you will. In fact, saints is defined as a person who is recognized as having an exceptional degree of holiness or likeness or closeness to God by secular dictionaries. And, and it's a process by which some religious groups go through in order to give someone the title after carefully evaluating their lives to see if they can substantiate things that were done by them while they were living. So in some of the religious circles that you come out of, in order to be a saint, you number one had to be dead. <clears throat> and then you have had to go through an evaluation of your life by a council of men who have tried to investigate the things you did while you were living to then come up with, in fact, whether you can have the title of saint or not, right? You know, that's what we're used to. And I want you to understand that the big difference between the way that modern religion looks at saint and the way the early church understood it is right here in verse 1. To the saints who are in Ephesus, that means that they are currently living in Ephesus, so they are alive. Ain't that something? So they were alive. In other words, he's writing to the saints, and the qualification for saint, according to Paul, is that anybody who was alive or dead but was in Christ Jesus. Amen? And this is something we got to hold on to because that means that if you know the Lord personally, if you have at some point come to know him as your personal Savior, then you are, in his eyes, a saint. So I can say, Amen, saints? Amen. And everybody that knows Jesus personally can say amen. And what that means is, saint, to go a little further, it means that you are considered by God to be holy and set apart as his own special individual son or daughter. We've already learned that. You are a son. You are an heir. And so I really don't care how you view yourself. Most of your uh, assessments of yourself are wrong anyway because you only see yourself through your fallen earthly eyes. And even you limit how you can discern yourself by the Spirit because you're evaluating the fact that you realize because you know your thoughts a little bit. We don't really even know all of ourselves the way God does, but you think about the things that you think about. You, you evaluate those things. You look at your life, and you see all of your shortcomings. 
And so if, if, if I were to call you a saint, you, the first thing that goes through your heart and mind is, well, not really. And your spouse, definitely not. They would say, no, he, he ain't no saint. <laughs> but I think what, what we have to begin to understand is, and I think what would bless our Father in heaven and what would bless our Lord Jesus Christ who laid down his life and looks at the holes in his wrist and, and he's saying, I'm calling you a saint. I need you to see yourself the way I see you. You are loved. You are the beloved. You are the one that I died for. I gave my life for. You are so precious to me, and I want to work in your life. So it doesn't matter where you are so much as where he's trying to take you. And so when it says to the saints who are in Ephesus, and many scholars don't even believe it was written to Ephesus, as I shared with you, and the main point of that of me even bringing it up is to just point out the fact that we can all just put ourselves in this letter and say, Paul is writing to me. So you, if you're sitting in here and you know Christ as your Savior, you are a saint, you are holy, and you are special in God. Amen? You need to believe that. And not just the saints, he says, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And then when we see that phrase, well, it bothers us again. Because I ain't always faithful. Man, am I excluded now? It's very interesting. And it's not that they were faithful in themselves, okay, but they're faithful because they're in Christ. In fact, the word in the Greek has kind of the, the two meanings, if you will. It can be applied as one who is, is trusty or trusted, and to somebody who's really faithful at what they're doing. Obviously, it can be used that way. But the other sense of it is someone who is easily persuaded, meaning that they are believing. What it means is someone who is easily persuaded by the Lord, someone who is confiding in and trusting in Christ is really what he's saying. The faithful in Christ, those who are faithful in that they are sensitive to his work in their lives. They're trusting in him. Now, when we back up now, you are automatically a saint by the fact that you're saved. Are you trusting in Jesus? Because these two things together says that he is actually talking to you in this letter because there's some special things that he wants you to find out. And he's not talking about those who are perfect because in this life we will have tribulation. We have an enemy. Things are going to happen. But God is with us. Amen? Amen. So to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, and the way the letter is even constructed, we can just simply assume, which he is, that he's just talking to us. He is doing that today. Notice he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot simpler introduction than what Paul normally uses. He always says grace and peace. Grace to you and peace from the Lord, from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, we understand that we're saved, and we're going to find out in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 2, right around verse 10, that we're saved by grace through faith. But Paul always greets and, and prays for grace and mercy to be upon the church. And I think one of the reasons, grace and peace, one of the reasons is that God's grace is constantly being multiplied into our lives. It's by his grace that we continue to live. Grace is undeserved favor of God. His, his, his love being show, uh, showered upon us because we are his saints. We are his beloved. And so grace never ends. We're always under the grace of God. It's God's grace that is with me. Otherwise, I would be done. And so he says, grace to you. His prayer is always that they would be under the grace of God. And peace, which we receive because we have been saved by grace. Now we are saints and we are experiencing the peace of God. Now I got to stop there though. Because we're going to get into this more in a second. God's peace should be in your life. Your life is not to be plagued with fear and doubt and anxiety and worry. None of those things are of the Lord. You know, the Bible says we haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. Amen? Amen. So we, we, these are things that we have to recognize, and we need to as we go into verse 3. So look at verse 3 as we pick it up. Verse 3, we're going to see the blessings of the Father. So we're going to look at this, this Trinity's work in our lives. The blessings of the Father is a first part of that. And notice what it says, verse 3. Look at it with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And that verse, I could honestly, I could do about three weeks in that verse. But I, don't, I won't do three weeks in that verse. But we'll get started. <clears throat> bless. Look at the word, bless. I love it. The root, I won't go through all of the Greek, but the root of it is eulogio, eulogio, basically. It's, it's where we get the word eulogize from in the English. 
Um, it means to praise or celebrate. And one of the most difficult things for me when I'm preparing for a funeral is to figure out the whole eulogy thing, especially if I didn't know the person personally. And a lot of times, in order to do that, I got to go get with the family and hang out with them and try to find out the things I can find out about the person, what their life was like, how they lived, the things they did. I remember one family I sat with, the, the whole family was there, and everybody just kind of was, was, I didn't have to ask any questions. They were just so, loved the person so much, they kept talking about the person and all the things that the person did. So it was very easy for me to just listen and find out some good stuff. But imagine there have been a few funerals where I didn't know anything or the person just wasn't good. It was a scoundrel. <laughs> just a low-down, dirty scoundrel. Now, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> now, the one thing I have just made in my own heart, I said, I am never going to get up and lie at a funeral. If the person was a dirty rat, then I can't do a eulogy. Because that's what it means. It means to eulogize the person. It means to, to, to celebrate and praise the person. And some people just ain't worth praising. and ain't nothing to celebrate about them, you know. <laughs> and so you're in a difficult spot. And so what I find myself doing in those cases is just delivering the gospel. So if you are the most bitter, contentious person in the room and you know it, you're just a grumpy person. <laughs> and, you, and I'm going to do your funeral. I want you to understand right now. All I'm, all I'm going to do... <laughs> All I'm going to do is deliver the gospel and sit down. I'm not going to get up there and lie about you. Don't try to get me to do it. I'm going to tell it like it is. I am going to tell it like it is. But that's what eulogize means. And so usually at a funeral, uh, and when I'm doing them, I include both a eulogy uh, and a gospel message. And usually I, I do the eulogy and give the family time or the close friends time to also say some things that are good about the person. Because when there's somebody who's really been good, y'all think about it for a second. Somebody that's really been good and they've done a lot of good things. They've, they've walked with the Lord through their life. You know, they were filled with his joy. You follow me? And when it's time to funeralize them, everybody is already understanding the kind of person they were. And it's so easy to say so many wonderful things. And so that's kind of what the word means. And I go through all of that to kind of help you understand what Paul is now doing in verse 3. Paul just broke out into spontaneous praise over God the Father for all the things that he has done because Paul's heart, I believe, is very full. He himself is writing from prison. And he's thinking about this church here in Ephesus and, and all that God has done there. And Paul has spent almost three years in Ephesus himself. Paul has already written letters to the church in Ephesus, 1 Timothy. He already wrote 1 Timothy, and Timothy spent a lot of time there. Ephesus has, if you will, received so much attention from Paul. And, and Ephesus is one of the centers of Christianity, if you will, in the early church. John the Apostle was the bishop in Ephesus for a while. You know, and so a lot of things went on in Ephesus. And so Paul just breaks out in spontaneous praise, praising, just praising God for all of the wonderful things that God has done. And that's what we're about to see, the blessings of the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what he says, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So listen very carefully. We're going to go through this. All right, the first praiseworthy truth is that we have spiritual blessings in Christ from God our Father. And I love that. And he's going to give us, listen, he's going to give us the, the type of blessings Number one, the type of blessings. The other blessings are spiritual. In other words, these are spiritual blessings that God the Father has given us in Christ. And we understand, look, we understand what physical blessings are, don't we? Amen. Yeah, we need physical blessings. We talk to God about physical blessings all the time. A young woman praying for a husband. And then God brings this handsome young man by, and, and, and he's blessed her. So praise be God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. A young man praying for a wife, you know. Someone praying for financial provision through a rough time, and God blesses them and carries them through that. Someone who may have health issues and praying for healing, and God does a miraculous or amazing work in their lives. You know, these are all good things. And, and, or the simple fact, listen, the simple fact of this, that everybody in this room drove the church and is sitting here clothed and looking nice in a wonderful place that he has provided so we could all say that God has really blessed us. If we get out of our American mentality for a second, according to, to global standards, God has blessed everybody in this room abundantly in a lot of ways. But all of those blessings will burn and be left behind. 
And the spiritual bless, excuse me, the physical blessings that we have, although they are great and God is providing those things for us, they do not measure to what Paul is talking about here. That God has also given us spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings. Listen, they are, look, exactly what they sound like. They are spiritual, meaning that these are blessings that we connect with and interact with through our spirit that God has given us, which implies that, the, that only those, listen, only those who are spirit beings or born again have the ability to enjoy these blessings. And only those who are led by the Spirit or walk by the Spirit, as we've learned in the book of Galatians, will actually be enjoying these blessings. You know, in fact, Romans says it this way, Romans 8, 9, y'all know this. It says that you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. In other words, that unless you have the Holy Spirit in you, there's no evidence that you are even born again. You're not. You can't be saved and not have God's Spirit in you because we have a brand new spiritual life. Amen? And so because you have a brand new spiritual life, with that come spiritual blessings. And although these blessings, listen, these blessings are inferior to God himself, they are far superior to our human state and the limitations that come with our human state. And therefore, they are higher than us, allowing us to experience, listen, to experience God at a greater extent. And I think sometimes we stay so focused on the natural and the physical that we miss what God is trying to do in our lives spiritually. I think we get so accustomed to this mediocre Christian living where it's all about what I do and what I am able to accomplish. You know, the, the early church relied completely on the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's one writer that said this, said that if 95, listen, if the Holy Spirit left the church today, 95% of what the church is doing would continue with nothing changed and most people wouldn't even notice the Holy Spirit had left the church. Whereas the early church, if the Holy Spirit had left them, 95% of what they were doing would have stopped and everybody would have recognized it. I get the impression, and as we have read even through the book of Galatians, that as spiritual beings, God wants us to walk in the Spirit. Remember Galatians chapter 5, that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Remember that? He wants to communicate with us in the Spirit. He wants to lead us by His Spirit. These are the things that we need to do. Therefore, unless, listen, unless you have the witness of the Spirit in you, well, you cannot draw on the wealth of the Spirit, which is what he's talking about here, the spiritual uh, 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 blessings. Romans tells us this too, chapter 8, verse 15 through 16. It says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. We didn't receive that. But you received the spirit of adoption by which you cry out, Abba, or Daddy, Abba, Father. We talked about that in Galatians, right? In other words, we're his children. We connect with him in the Holy Spirit. So he says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And I love that. And so he says that he has given us spiritual blessings. In other words, the blessings that God has given us are, are things that we connect with him on on a spiritual level. Now, what's the scope of these blessings? Notice what he says in verse 3 again, that he's given us, he's blessed us with uh, every spiritual blessing. In other words, every is the scope, meaning that whatever spiritual blessings there are, he's given us all of them. He hasn't limited us at all from any spiritual blessing. Now, in the natural, there's some physical blessings that you wish you had. Be honest. And he hasn't promised to give you everything that you want on this earth. There's some things that you will pray for and long for, and it will not happen. This is not a prosperity message, and you will not have your best life now. It's yet to come. So in the natural, it's not always going to be perfect. It's not supposed to be perfect because we can't grow in that kind of environment. We can't grow without hardship, without a little bit of trial, right? We've talked about that. He's talking about spiritual blessings. In fact, Paul said it this way to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 19. He says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The things that are needful, he's going to supply them, and they're needful for the purpose of him growing us to be more conformed to his son. 
So one of the things that we need in order to experience spiritual blessings is to surrender to his perfect will and begin to seek him on a spiritual level and not evaluate how good of a father he is based upon your physical circumstance. He doesn't have to change your physical circumstance to show you how amazing he is. In fact, I see how amazing he is when he doesn't change the surroundings but does the work in me. And every time I go to pray about somebody else I'm having trouble with, all he shows me is myself. <laughs> and by the time he finishes with me, I see them differently. And that's the way he works. So in other words, all of the blessings of the Holy Spirit are available to us. So why are we not experiencing them? All, look, notice he says every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. Now, let's continue to build the, 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 build the verse or to, to take it apart, I should say. Notice he also tells us where these blessings are located. Notice he says in heavenly places. I love that. I'm thankful that they're in heavenly places, okay? So they're not down here. They're not of this earth. They are spiritual. They are already in heaven. I was talking with the Lord about this yesterday because we just talk. That's my prayer life. I just talk to him. You know, that's prayer. I just wanted to throw that out there. So we talk about these things. And, and the Lord says, yeah, you know, you, you operate in a physical environment and you are in your physical body as you do that. And there are limitations to that. But that is not the way that I want to interact with you. Like the intimacy and the best part of our relationship will happen on a different level. It will happen when you seek after him personally and in your private time in a different way. And the experience that you have with him is far greater than the physical. They are in heavenly places. The blessings that he's giving us here, and he's talking about these spiritual blessings, are already in heaven with the Lord. And guess what? I can commune with him in the heavens. I know y'all think Pastor Kevin's crazy, and I am, but I'm, I'm realizing that, you know what, my time with him is not spent here. When I hit my knees, my time with him is spent there. How does that work? Because I approach him in his throne room through the vehicle of this communication he's given us, which is prayer. And that doesn't even get good until it becomes spiritual, until it goes beyond my thinking beyond my physical want and need and my current situation to approach a most holy God that is above all of this junk to begin with. And he begins to speak to me in that, that perfect moment where he and I are in communication and everything else can begin to fade away. You with me? And so he says they're in heavenly places. And now look at who administers these blessings. Listen to me very careful. Notice what it says in the verse. In heavenly places, but the administrator is, it says, in Christ. Jesus. It says, in Christ is what it says. In other words, these spiritual blessings, which are abundant, are in heavenly places, and they are in Christ. And guess who, what? I am in Christ. So the one who administrates the blessings is the same one who bears the scars of my salvation. He's the one administering the gifts. And he doesn't want to hold them back from me. Look at the verse again. Now that we've kind of gone through there, let's read the verse again. Let's start at the beginning. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And I love that. See, the one thing that the Ephesians lacked when Paul first arrived was an understanding of spiritual blessings. Listen to me very carefully. <clears throat> I won't make you turn there because we don't have time. Paul arrived in Acts chapter 19. You go look at it in your own time in Ephesus. And, and here's a, a secret that we don't always think about. Listen, the church of Ephesus was not planted by Paul. It was planted by Apollos, according to Acts chapter 18. Apollos, who had his doctrine wrong, and Aquila and Priscilla, y'all nod if you're with me a little bit. Priscilla and Aquila had to pull him aside. The Bible says he was very eloquent, mighty in speech. So that means that everybody loved listening to him because he was eloquent, mighty in speech, probably handsome, who knows. And he was a preacher. He could because people listened to him. Some people can just talk because, you know, people like listening to him. But his doctrine was wrong. The Bible says he only understood the baptism of John, okay? So they corrected him. 
Now, he leaves Ephesus and goes to Corinth. Now, the last place you need a guy like Apollos is in Corinth because they were carnal, but uh, that's another message. So he shows up, he went to Ephesus and thoroughly messed up the Ephesians. <laughs> he taught them a little bit about Jesus. And he stopped at the baptism of John. So when Paul so, shows up in Acts chapter 19, the Bible says he finds some disciples and he asks them a all important question. Do y'all remember the question? Not if you remember the question. He says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we don't even know anything about a Holy Spirit. He says, well, then in, in, check it out. His question, into what were you baptized? Because obviously it wasn't in the, into Christ the proper way. And they says, into John's baptism. Well, Paul says, well, John indeed baptized for repentance, preaching the Christ who would come. And then he taught them about the Christ who had come. And they believed the fullness of the gospel message. And the Bible says that they were baptized and they began to speak with other tongues. In other words, they were, if you will, discipled by someone that didn't have the doctrine completely right. And this is something that we as a church have to watch out for today. They were missing the most important part of the whole thing. They were missing the truth that Jesus not only came and died for our sin, but he was resurrected and that he has poured his spirit out upon the church that we may be connected to him as his children. You follow me? The one thing they were missing is what he's talking about now that they actually have. Now, here's the thing. Listen to me very carefully because we're running out of time. Not to know and depend on the Holy Spirit's provision is to live a life of spiritual poverty. Well, what does spiritual poverty look like? Well, spiritual poverty is a person who is a Christian, as we call it, who knows the Lord, but now, if you will, struggles with every degree of their walk with him as if they have no spiritual blessings in heavenly places, which can literally transform who they are as they live in Christ. And I'm not talking about any prosperity stuff in the physical. A person who lives constantly bound by whether it be fear or the anxiety or the impression or the doubt or the worry or the struggle in every situation, the, the, the constant marital struggle, the constant work struggle, the constant everything struggle that goes on in our lives, which we all deal with. We all deal with it. Everyone in this room can nod their head. You don't have to. Paul is saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And I can't get past the verse because it says that he's blessed us with every single possible spiritual blessing that could exist. And I don't know what they all are. I don't think we can count them. I don't think we can fathom the wealth of the blessings that God actually has for us. And I think that we miss it when we fail to fall on our face and cry out to him and to, to be constantly washing his word and to constantly engage him in our life. And we are so distracted with all the things of life that we're actually missing what he wants to do in our life. And I think that's where a lot of Christians live. And I think that he wants you to push that aside and say, Lord, here I am. Have your way with me. And so quickly we can go out the door today and go right back into the routine of life. And I understand it. It's, 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 it's a battle, but he's given us every possible spiritual blessing. What that means is if there is a spiritual blessing out there, I want to find it. I want to know what it is. Show me all of them, Lord. Give me one. One that he's given me, honestly, he's given me just a simple uh, sense of, of faith and peace. Now, I'm not a faith giant, as some may go, but I just have this 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 faith that almost seems stupid because I just feel like he's going to take care of it in his own way and in his own time. So I'm not going to let it consume me. And whenever I start feeling different from that, there's a real big problem in my life. And I got to go away and get along with him. Like, Lord, I don't know what's going on right now, but the peace that I know exists because I've experienced it all these years, what's happening to me? You know, and then I began to say, look, because you're not supposed to live in, in a place where you don't have his peace. My peace I leave with you, he said. You're not supposed to live as a Christian without that. And if you're a Christian and you don't have his peace, you are missing out on his spiritual blessings. And it should alarm you to the point that you stop and you say, well, Lord, where did I go wrong? How do I get back on track? 
You know, and here's the thing. What most of you want me to do now is give you a magic button that you can push to make this all work out. And the thing is, he won't allow me to give you that even if I knew what it was because he wants you to seek him individually because you are an individual. He doesn't want you relying on a person. He doesn't want you to take the easy way out like Americans do with everything else. That's why, you know, you know, people can send emails and we can get off track and say, this one will make you lose 50 pounds in one week. <laughs> really, you know? Watch this video and you, you know, and whatever. That's the way we live. We think like that. No, no, there's no easy way out here. There's no way that you can get around this. God desires you. Listen, God desires you to seek him out because he's already sought you out. And he's saying, here I am. And I'm available. Every spiritual blessing. So if you're lacking spiritual blessings, you can find them very close by by calling on the Lord. And you can start today by hitting your knees. Now listen, we got to at least try to finish this section. He says, just as, and this is big, the way the flow of the language. Now remember, Paul, Paul is not making any stop between verse 3 and verse 4. He's not going to take a breath until he gets to verse 14, which is going to take us three or four weeks. Just as he chose us in him. Now, you got to follow the language carefully. Just as he, God the Father, that's who we're talking about, chose us in him, the, the capital him there is Christ Jesus, okay? We're going to see this all the way through. So just as he, God, chose us in him, Christ Jesus, notice before the foundation of the world, stop for a second. What on earth is he talking about? He chose us before the foundation of the world. Now, for all of us, we want to be chosen for something. You know, ain't nothing worse than the kid that doesn't get picked for the game or he's the last one to get picked, right? You ever been? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> nothing worse than that. But he chose, it's this doctrine of election. In other words, God chose you individually. He chose us collectively, but he chose you individu individually, excuse me, before the foundation of the world, which means that before he actually went about the business of saying, let there be, and stuff started happening, before all of that, it's almost like God in eternity's past thought the whole thing through and just saw as he stands outside of time, the whole thing. And you got to understand something. He saw all of it. So therefore, he saw himself creating an earth and creating man and putting man in the earth. And because of the way he would create man, giving man free will, he saw man sinning in the garden and falling. And all of the things that would happen after that, he saw it all. He envisioned all of it. And after looking at the whole thing, he still determined in his, his heart that he would do it anyway and choose you. In other words, he's already desired you and chose you before he began any of it. Notice, I'll come back to verse 4, having predestined us to adoption. You see that in verse 5? You see that in verse 5? What has he done? He's predestined. What has he done? Listen, he predestined, he predetermined, or he determined beforehand that you would be adopted as sons and daughters by Christ Jesus. And, and what he's doing is, listen, according to his knowledge of all from start to finish, seeing the whole thing, seeing how ugly you would be, seeing you in all your filthy sin and all my filthy sin, he saw all of that. And even in all of that, he determined, listen, he determined that it was still so worth it to do it all to gain those who he knew would respond to his love and be saved. And he gave us the free will to choose. And he knew that he would lose some. And listen, by the way, free will is necessary for the relationship that he actually desires to have with us. He wants us to choose him, even though he knows those who will do it. He wants us to choose him because that's a blessing to him. Having not seen him, you believe in him. That's faith. That blesses him. So having seen it all, y'all, listen, all of your filth, all of the sin, all of the things that would go on, God still determined in his own heart that it was worth it for him to go ahead with the plan that he could redeem you because he knew you would come. And you got to understand, because he knew you would come, he started. So then, therefore, God is the initiator of all of this. And when you think about it like that, the language we use today for salvation has to change. You know, a lot of people try to say, well, you know, I just gave my heart to the Lord. No, we ain't give the Lord nothing. We ain't got nothing to give. No, he initiated. He knew you were coming. 
He knew that you would call upon him once you heard the gospel message of your salvation, which he's going to deal with further down. So he initiated, he had it all played out as if the, the, the chess masters were waging a, a, a major match. God doesn't need to go step by step. He stands outside of time. He sees the end from the beginning. He sees all of it and he says, I chose you. He initiated. You did nothing. You didn't give your life to him. You exercise your free will, but you wouldn't have been able to do it unless he initiated to begin with. Unless he, by his spirit, began to draw you by his gospel message, you wouldn't be saved. It's all on him from start to finish. We are a work of our beloved God. So he chose you in him, in Christ Jesus, before the foundation of the world. You are special. You are not an afterthought. He never, ever, ever, you know, chanced anything. He doesn't deal with that. God set out to save for himself a people. And it says that we should be, notice what it says, holy and without blame before him in love. And you do not feel that way today, which tells us that this is where he's going with us. This is the work he's begun in us. What's that finished product going to look like? Look at the verse, y'all. Number one, it means that when you stand before him, you will be holy. In the Old Testament, things had to be holy by the sprinkling of blood. It had to be cleansed with blood to even be able to, to be used or be in the tabernacle to begin with. And anything that got defiled had to be sprinkled with blood again. What he's saying is everything is separate from God except those things, those people who have been sprinkled, if you will, by the blood of Christ. And so he's saying that you are clean, you are holy, you are set aside as a special person because of Christ that you may be without blame, meaning that when you stand before the Lord, there will be no blame. Whenever you see a destruction, somebody's to blame. There's a mess at home. One of my two is to blame. <laughs> no, his work he's doing is in us now is that when we stand before him, there will be no blame. Sin will be thrown away. We will be washed, clean, a complete special work that will stand before him without blame, before him in love. This is where we're headed. This is the work that he's doing in us. These are the riches of the Father. And because that's what he's doing and because he already loves us and because it has nothing to do with us to the extent that he initiated everything, he gave us free will and gave us the opportunity to come to him knowing that we would, that when it all wraps up, we'll stand before him perfect. And so from that standpoint, looking back, he's blessed up with every spiritual blessing because he's working that out in us now as we go. Amen? And so I'm going to have to stop there because I'm over time. But I, I think the challenge is this. If we have every spiritual blessing available, we need to begin to seek them out this week. Amen? You need to be like, you need to be able to begin to say, well, Lord, what spiritual blessing can you give me for this situation I'm in today? And he will. He'll bless you. He'll meet you where you are. And I have to say, just be, with my own experience, I've been saved for, I don't know how many, 25 maybe years, I don't know. But he's been faithful in all of that. I've been in ministry for going on 11, well, probably 12 when you count the days before pastoring. And he has been faithful. And he shows up and gives you what you need at the moment that you need it. If you're walking with him and you're continuing in communication with him. You follow me? So tomorrow, listen, tomorrow he will give you what you need in the places that you're going to go to. Whether it's the classroom or the job or whatever. He will give you what you need on the spot to navigate this world. In other words, we need to draw upon his spiritual blessings that we need for every walk and, and situation that we find ourselves in in this life. That's what I believe that God will do for you. And I ask you to, to go to him in prayer about it. And ask him to show you. Amen? And he won't let you down. Father, we do thank you today. We love you for your word. We thank you that, Lord, it, it speaks to us like nothing else can. And I pray for every person in this room. Lord, even as they prepare to leave this place, don't let the things that you have said fall to the ground, Lord. But let it be absorbed into their hearts and into their minds, Lord. That you would draw them into a closer relationship with you this week. That you would speak to them that you would draw them into your word, that you would give them discernment for every situation, Lord God, and that they would have victory over the flesh and over sin this week. Lord, realizing what they have in you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, amen. Please, let's stand and sing.